The Financial Inclusion Commission was established in recognition of the fact that while Britain prides itself on being a global leader in financial services, too many of our citizens are excluded from access to those services. The sort of services that you need to, to build a better life for yourself and your family, access to a basic bank account or to insurance. And so we brought together a group of parliamentarians across the, the political spectrum, uh, a group of experts led by Sir Sherrod Cooper-Coles, the former ambassador, to be able to give a really sharp focus to recommendations, drawing on evidence from those directly affected and from experts around the country. On the panel we have quite a strong view that actually the way to address this is from a consumer needs and behaviour perspective rather than from a product perspective. People use financial products in different ways for different reasons and it's that combination of people's behaviour and different product features that can cause problems. So I think you have to be able to look at the product offering in the context of what people need to use it for and how their behaviour is likely to change while they're using it. The evidence we've been giving today has been all about what we understand to be the real issues for customers at risk of exclusion and what we as a bank can do to help them. So the work we've been doing for example with credit unions to support them to help customers, rolling out with our own staff more knowledge, working with organisations like the Citizens Advice Bureau, Money Advice Service and making sure that the customers that we serve, about 2 million or so active basic bank account customers, have all the products that they need and the access to those products through the Link ATM network for free, for example, and across the counters in our branches. A huge amount has changed over the last little while, so obviously we've had the credit crunch. We've seen the profile of people in debt change quite significantly, so whereas it used to be people coming to us saying that they had uh, taken out some credit and now they were struggling to pay it back, now it's much more about people saying we simply cannot manage, our income is flat, our expenditure is rising and we're struggling to uh, meet the gap. One of the aspects of the Commission's work that I think has been very valuable is that we've not been as London-centric as some policy initiatives are. We've got out on the road and gone to see people in areas where financial exclusion is really much more prevalent than anybody would like, in places like Liverpool, Cardiff and Glasgow. So I think we've got a good view, not just a policymaker's view, of the things that need to be done about financial exclusion. What we think is needed in the affordable credit space is somebody, a bank, supported by government, financial institution, who is not going to be last in, first out, but is going to be first in, last out, in terms of raising the finance that alternative credit suppliers in the not-for-profit area need to scale up their business and provide more loans for more people who will continue to need them. Well, lots of what I was talking about was um, about the lived experience of, of communities that are operate um, below the radar, many of them that live around a ca ca cash economy and don't um, feel that they are, are part of society, so they don't feel that they have a belonging in terms of having bank accounts or a form of ID, so they don't access credit or loans in the same way that you and I may, may do. Um, it's a very emotive um, way of living and it's very... Um, um, month to month rather than any long term plans. Well, financial inclusion and welfare reform meet because there are, you know, there are three big drivers. So there's uh, less money in the system. The LGA has estimated that 11.8 billion are being taken out of the welfare system by 2015 16. Um, but there's also a within the reforms, especially universal credit, a transfer of responsibility to claimants to manage their own financial affairs in new ways. And there's a transfer of responsibility to local councils working together with their voluntary sector and private sectors and residents um, to develop ways of supporting people who are financially excluded and need that extra support. We've only recently seen, I think, financial inclusion rise up uh, the political agenda and I think that's mostly to do with the fact that people are struggling. But what I'd like to see is a sustained interest in this agenda, um, not just when times are, da are bad. This is a, a core life skill after all and we need to see for, the, for, for years to come uh, financial education and inclusion uh, as a key part of everything that we do. So the challenge we have in the UK is about 10.5 million adults, so nearly 20% of the adult population, don't have sufficient digital skills to participate in mainstream society and that's by their own admission, so nearly 20% of the population. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to find practical solutions to bring that number down. 
The way that we tend to see uh, financial inclusion and the breadth of that uh, is that uh, we have to reach uh, not only that group of people, the one third of all families who have no savings whatsoever, but also that group of families just above that level typically in terms of income uh, for whom savings are perhaps enough to live uh, for a couple of weeks before they run out of money. They need to be more included in our system. In the future I'd like to see something implemented in schools where children and young people would be taught about how to manage their finances properly instead of just being told, oh, you can go to a payday lender um, somewhere where your money can be properly managed and budgeted by yourself. Well, we estimate there are about three million um, households at the moment who are in severe crisis point debt. Um, but beyond that, there's a trail. They think of there being a slope. At the top end, there's about 20 million um, who are juggling their, their finances to try and make ends meet. Then you've got 15 million who are um, showing at least one sign of financial distress. What policymakers need to start doing is focusing much more up the slope. By the time people have got to that point of crisis debt, we know that 78% uh, of them will be so stressed that they won't be sleeping properly. 2% will tell us that they've given their job up or had to give their job up because they were so ill because of the stress of debt. 7% um, of them, their relationships would have broken down. Children in households that are indebted say they're twice as likely to be bullied than children in non-indebted households. So in that process, as people are sliding down that slope, the pressure and the detriment on them is really building. So the real challenge is how do we get to people earlier and stop that before it starts. Financial inclusion is about maximising the number of people, the number of businesses that are part of the mainstream financial system. It's rather as though we're trying to make sure that everyone in society, just as they benefit from the road system, just as they benefit from the health system, so they benefit from and are part of uh, the regular financial system.